Good morning. The reading today is taken from Acts chapter 8, beginning at verse 26. It can be found on page 123 at the back of the Bibles. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go towards the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to the, and, and, sorry, and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a ship, sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb, silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotos, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. Sorry about that. Good morning. Nice to see you. So we've been hearing about Philip, haven't we, sharing the gospel in Samaria as a result of them spreading out due to persecution. And despite opposition, there's something funny going on here. What is it? Sorry. Is that better? Great. So despite the... Oh, and this is why I hate this mic. Sorry, it's my fault. Just need to do that. Okay, trying again. Is that better? Yes. Hurrah. Okay. So despite the... Oh, can I just use this one? No. Okay, we're going, right? Despite opposition, like the microphone, the good news has been spread actually quite successfully in Samaria, and the passion of those sharing the good news is really, really obvious. So I wonder, what are you passionate about? Gavin Calver, who co-wrote this book with Anne Calver, um, that we've, we've been looking at uh, quite a bit over the last couple of months. He spoke to a researcher on passion and he asked how you can tell what people are passionate about. His thinking was it was probably what people spent their money on. I think I might have guessed the same, but apparently what you spend your money on is the result of social conditioning. What actually gives away people's passion is what they give their time to and what they speak about. 
In fact, this expert said that in a 30-minute conversation, you can always tell what somebody is passionate about. So I wonder, what would a 30-minute conversation with you reveal? Work? Children or grandchildren? Golf? I'm looking in one particular direction. <laughs> Your pets? Hobbies? Or Jesus? Jane talked last week about being able to share our faith. And I just I wonder how you're getting on with that. Not just in this week, but generally. If you did miss um, last week, I'd really encourage you to catch up using our YouTube channel or on Facebook. You know, we definitely see Philip as someone who was passionate about Jesus because his conversations all seemed to lead to sharing Jesus. And the results were that the good news was spread significantly in Samaria, a place that perhaps they wouldn't have expected a good reception. Although if you're familiar with the story of the Samaritan woman at the well with Jesus in John chapter 4, and if you're not, do read it. I wonder if the way had been paved before a little. But this morning, we read of an account in the desert between Philip and an Ethiopian eunuch. An unusual, unexpected encounter by all accounts, yet significant and in really an unexpected place. So we're going to consider what led them both to that desert road. We'll explore the encounter and then consider where it took them both and what we can learn from all of that. Ministry was going really well for Philip in Samaria. So why do we see him go to the desert road? Not an easy or comfortable place when all was going well. Well, quite simply for Philip, he was told by an angel of God to go there. And he obeyed. I hope this might be something we all aspire to, not necessarily specifically the desert road, but following the direction of the Spirit. And it's something that in sermons I've heard on this passage before, that's something that's often the focus. And I do want to look at that some more. But I also want to consider the Ethiopian eunuch. What brought him there? And what was the significance of his conversion for him and perhaps for others? Now, this is harder to explore. And we're going to have to use some supposition and understanding from other historical contexts. He isn't even named, so we can't identify him. And I think that this is because in the society of the day, he would have been marginalized and someone considered in many contexts to be insignificant by world standards. He's Ethiopian and so therefore a eunuch, uh, therefore a Gentile, sorry. And he's a eunuch. Now, in biblical understanding, this could mean one of three things. Either he was born this way, or he was made to be this way by others through castration, or he was someone who chose to be celibate. Now, I don't know for sure, but my wondering is that he might have been made this way by others. And I'm thinking this because we read that he was a court official in the court of Queen Candace of Ethiopia. Now, eunuchs were frequently made to be so in some cultures to be trusted with the female royals, trusted in that they wouldn't be tempted with the royal women in the same way that other men might have been. In cultures where women were generally, even the uh, wealthy ones and royal ones, seen as possessions. We see this use of eunuchs in royal courts elsewhere in the Bible as well, portrayed in the book of Esther, where a king, whose name I can't pronounce, ruled from India to Ethiopia. Eunuchs were placed in charge of the king's women. Now, obviously, there's a whole issue of patriarchy and power play of that system that we actually haven't got time for today, but I do want to note it and put it out there. So while eunuchs were put in trusted positions in royal courts and relied on and trusted, in society at large, actually, they were more of a reviled group, outcasts. This particular man was on his way home, we're told, from going to Jerusalem to worship. Except when he was in Jerusalem trying to enter the temple, he would have encountered problems. 
Firstly, as a Gentile, he might only have been allowed into the outer court because that was the limit for all Gentiles. Yet as a eunuch, he may not even have got that far because there was a law in Deuteronomy 23 which bans men with such affected male parts from being admitted to God's assembly. So probably he had travelled all that way to worship the God of the Jews who he's either trying to find out more about or has possibly come to believe in somehow. He's travelled all that way to be met with rejection for these various reasons. And it's on this desert road and emotionally perhaps in a desert space himself that we find him reading scripture on his way home and trying to make sense of it. He's reading from Isaiah 53. And before the piece that Sue read in our passage today, just before that, it's talking about the Lord's servant. And just before the bit we heard said, he would have read about how this Lord's servant was despised and rejected by others. I kind of imagine that he can relate to this passage, having just experienced that rejection for himself. And he's desperately trying to find out more about this Lord's servant who he can really identify with. So they meet on this desert road, Philip having come from a place of great success and the Ethiopian eunuch from a place of rejection. The eunuch is reading from Isaiah out loud. That wasn't uncommon then at all. And so Philip is able, prompted by the Spirit, to engage with him in what he's reading and ask if he understands it. And as we heard, he admits he doesn't and invites Philip to explain. What a gift of an opportunity for both of them. Philip loved to share Jesus and explain the gospel. And the eunuch was obviously keen to understand and encounter God for himself. You know, in the passage that we heard, this part, this conversation feels so brief, feels momentary. But actually, I imagine it to be a really long conversation and that Philip travels with him for several hours at least. Philip, with all his preaching in Samaria, has already broken social conventions of including those who would have been excluded just as Jesus did. And again, here we find him having no problem including this man who would have been rejected. He includes him to the point of baptizing him at his request when they come across some water. And then the encounter just comes to an abrupt end. When they come up out of the water, Philip is snatched away by the Spirit of the Lord and finds himself at Azores. That's probably at least 20 miles away from where they were. And he then continued preaching the gospel in all the towns he came to until he came to Caesarea. In other words, before he met the Ethiopian eunuch, he was going that way. And then suddenly he's going back up north again. Whereas the Ethiopian eunuch continued south on his way home, rejoicing, changed, restored, and included, and I imagine so thankful. Potentially one of the first Christians in Africa and potentially the first missionary. So what can we learn for ourselves and for our context? I think the one thing that we can take from this is Philip's willingness to go to the unexpected and his willingness to share the gospel wherever he finds himself in whatever context. He's willing to follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit and take risks. One of the ways we can learn to do that is practice, to give it a go, to take risks. If we think we hear the Spirit prompting, and that could be in a really clear way, or it could be in a way where we're just not sure about it. We can try it. We can even play a little and ask God to teach us. Now, some of us, of course, will find that easier than others. I remember about 15 years ago, maybe more, I was traveling on a train when a young man had obviously forgotten his rail pass and was about to be given a fine if he couldn't either produce the pass or pay for a ticket. 
And I remember feeling God prompting me to offer to pay the, for the ticket. And I was really struggling with this. But not at all about the money. I really didn't care about that at all. What bothered me was having to move across the train to go and interrupt this conversation, speak to somebody I didn't know, and just didn't like the idea of drawing attention to myself. That made me feel really uncomfortable. So for me, the challenge was to put myself out there and share God's love in this practical way. And I wrestled for a few minutes and then gave in and went over. As I reflected on it afterwards, it was interesting to learn that what might prevent me from being obedient to God's promptings was about not wanting to draw attention to myself. And I had to pray for a boldness to overcome that natural instinct. I have grown, I have seen myself care much less about that over the years, but it's still something that is my first instinct and reaction. What holds us back will be different for each one of us, but are we willing to go whatever the obstacle and go where God prompts us to share his good news, whether that's in words like Philip or in a practical way? I hope that we can all grow in courage to share in words when the situation requires it. Sometimes it can help to practice sharing what God has done for us in safe spaces, such as life groups, so that we're used to telling our stories. And we can also practice hearing from the Spirit in safe spaces like these or friendship groups or wherever. Perhaps we can try listening for an encouraging word for each other and then see what God teaches us through that and through other people's responses. And let's look forward to hearing next week when Jane is going to be exploring with us about hearing from God. The other thing I feel we can learn from this encounter, though, is from the Ethiopian eunuch. He's been to Jerusalem to seek God, to worship And I suspect, as I say, he'd been met with hostility and rejection, and yet he didn't lose hope because when we meet him on his way home, he's reading and wrestling with scriptures. He didn't just give up. For me, this is such a reminder that even when we're met with rejection or are struggling to encounter God in some way, that we keep pursuing because actually it's often when we persist that God meets us in the most surprising ways in those hard desert places. I wonder how this can apply to others in our current day context, who are in positions that might not be something ideal for them. You know, the eunuch was in service, and he'd been made, perhaps, to be a eunuch by the hand of others. Yet he met God, and it transformed him. Let's think for a minute about those who are trapped in modern slavery. People trafficked or forced sex workers. How about those who are maimed in various ways by the hands of others? Maybe closest to this particular example is women who experience FGM or female genital mutilation for cultural or religious reasons. And then again, both those here and in other cultures who are shunned in society. There's so many examples of those. You know, many of these categories, though not all, are disproportionately affecting women. Of course, there are men who are affected in some of these ways as well. And men actually who, for medical reasons, need to undergo castration. And for them, the problems will be different and often hidden because, you know, in Britain, we just don't talk about this stuff, do we? There'll be physical, mental, and emotional effects of this that will affect them deeply and can make people feel different and separated from others. You know, if any of these issues affect you personally, please come and talk to someone today or ask for prayer over in the back corner. But let's also pray for all of these people in these different kinds of situations to have similar encounters with someone who can share the gospel with them for their own transformation and rescue, but also that they might also transform the lives of others in their context. We can also look to support charities that help people if it feels a bit overwhelming that we can't maybe make an individual difference 
we can support charities that are working in so many of these different contexts. Back in May, it was a great joy um, at the Women's Weekend. We were able to give over £750 to the Orchid Project, a charity helping women who've suffered through FGM. There are other charities, Hope for Justice and Beyond the Streets, just to name a couple, but do a Google search. You'll see all sorts of opportunities to support charities. And what about closer to home? Perhaps consider, is there anyone in your life who is marginalized? And if so, is there a way you can reach out to them? We see in this account that God really has a heart for the outcast. He sends a personal message to the eunuch. You know, if God can send Philip to a desert road to meet an Ethiopian eunuch to transform his life and then impact a, con impact a continent, who might God send to others in similar situations? We can pray big and bold on that one. And what if he sent you? Would you go? I think finally, the other thing that is helpful for us is that the gospel is bigger than our expectation. I don't know what Philip was expecting when he went to the desert road. Quite possibly not a lot compared to the successful place he had been. I don't know what the Ethiopian was expecting when he traveled home. I suspect that neither of them expected what they actually found and encountered. But the Spirit drew them together specifically for that encounter. I don't know what they expected when they went from there either. But it helps us to remember that as amazing as the encounter was for the Ethiopian eunuch to go on home from that place changed and to know he was seen and loved by God, I think it helps us to note that he also left that encounter carrying something he didn't before. He went from seeking God to knowing and experiencing God and then carrying God by his spirit with him. He would have taken the good news with him to a whole new continent. Many others would follow after him over the years. But he took the good news home to share with those he met. So it's not just an encounter to affect one as important and special as that is, but actually it results in affecting the many. It's when we are willing to offer what we have, our little, that God can bless and multiply that for the blessing of many. The feeding of the 5,000, a story that many of you will be familiar with in the Gospels, where five loaves and two fish are brought and Jesus blesses and multiplies it to not just feed over 5,000 people, but actually have 12 baskets left over. Can we offer our, offer our little so God can bless many? I remember at uni, faithfully trying to share Jesus with one particular friend. Sometimes gently, sometimes more directly, both in words and deeds. I really felt God place her on my heart. But to be honest with you, it felt completely useless and completely pointless. I felt nothing was happening. So imagine my surprise when several years later I received a letter from her out of the blue. We hadn't kept in touch. To say that she'd become a Christian and that my sharing with her at uni had been really helpful and significant. I had absolutely no idea. And in fact, I only know that now because she took the trouble to write to me. You know, we may not know how God is using what we offer. We can only be faithful in following where he calls us and offering what we have. But can I just encourage us to practice expecting more, to praying bolder, and imagining that God can do way more with our little than we can imagine. I think that will really encourage us to say yes when he asks the unexpected of us. We're just going to take a moment to see what God wants to say to us individually. Mainly we're going to be quiet, but I'm going to just share a couple of words 
that the prayer team um, had when they were listening earlier before the service. You might like to stand at this point, but if you're more comfortable where you are, that's fine as well. So there were a few words that I think really relate to this. There was a word of encouragement for someone you may feel that you are of no use to God, even useless, but God sees you differently and trusts in you. There's another word which says, be the sweet aroma of Christ. Don't compare yourself with others. You have a unique aroma. Another one just encouraging to spread the radiance of Christ. And lastly, believe that you make a difference, however small. So Holy Spirit, would you come and speak to us now? Would you stir in our hearts if those words are particularly for us? Would you prompt us with what we've thought about this morning? Would you encourage us to take risks where you're calling us to go. Would you give us the courage we need for that? Would you help us to persist in seeking you when we're in desert spaces? Lord, speak to our hearts. Lord, would you help us to have great expectations in what you can do? Would you grow our faith and grow our anticipation? Lord, would you continue to do your work as we continue through our service?